Welcome to the CondoVultures.com podcast with your host, Peter Zalewski, a Miami real estate broker, Wall Street consultant, and expert witness. This podcast is focused on identifying real estate buying opportunities in the South Florida condo market, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. The CondoVultures.com podcast is not authorized by the South Florida real estate industry and will most likely annoy many of the region's talking heads. This podcast will feature straight talk and salty language that could be offensive to some. Please remember that part <sighs> past investment success does not determine future gains, especially in the South Florida's volatile condo market. For more information, please visit condovultures.com. Don't buy a South Florida condo discounted or distressed before taking a condo vultures correction tour. Condovultures.com offers weekly bus and walking tours that focus on educating buyers on the how-tos of identifying discounted condos, analyzing the opportunities, and purchasing units. Every tour attendee receives a list of all condo projects in a particular market, a market assessment handout, and unmatched expert analysis. For more information on the condo correction tours, please visit condovultures.eventbrite.com. This is Peter Zaluski of the Condo Vultures podcast. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. And I wanted to alert you that if you uh, have a property that you're looking to sell in the Tri-County, South Florida area, I would encourage you to reach out to Jenny Horta, a licensed real estate broker with CVRRealty.com. She's my partner. She's been in the business for uh, north of 15 years. More importantly, she knows the market. She knows how to get that deal done. And she also realizes that it's more important to get a price that you can accept and sell the property rather than the hold firm on some price that's never going to be achieved and ultimately languish on the market. So if you're looking to do, do a deal that you want a skilled expert who can help you sell a property, reach out to Jenny Hortis at 305-865-5859, 305-865-5859, or visit her website, cvrrealty.com. Welcome to the Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Saluski from Condo Vultures. If you're tuning in this podcast, you're going to hear our conversation. My current and former journalist talking about some of the biggest stories that have occurred within the last week. What we will do is we will discuss six stories that I handpick. I send them off to the journal work and I ask each journalist to go ahead and read the stories, review the stories, and we're going to go ahead and discuss these stories. Now, who is our target market for this podcast? Well, we are a podcast for developers. We're a podcast for sellers, investors, lenders, and even gadflies. So if you go to a cocktail party, you want something interesting to say, chances are you might hear something on our podcast that you're not hearing anywhere else on the street. Now, before I go ahead and start to introduce uh, the panel this particular week, let me lay out some real basics. If you have any questions for us, if you have any comments, go ahead and shoot us a message on X, which is formerly Twitter. You can get us at Miami RRP, at Miami RRP, which stands for Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. Another thing I want to point out too is that we are now selling merch, merchandise. So if uh, you want to support what we're doing, we're not making a lot of money on it, but basically we're trying to push the marketing effort. Go to condovultures.com. When you go to condovultures.com, you'll see a merch category. Click on that and you'll we'll be able to see our entire invite. So um, all that being said, let me go ahead and introduce the uh, guests or the members of the podcast this particular week. We have a gentleman who was a journalist for over 25 years. Right now, his public is marketing firm. He's based in Miami. His name is John Groos. The name of his company is Groos Communications. You can check out his website, which is groosspr.com, G-R-U-S-S-P-R.com. You can also get him on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get him at Jean, J-E-A-N, Groos, G-R-U-S-S. What's going on, hey, Mr. Groos? How are you today? going? Everything is, uh, everything is well, although, you know, coming to the office to record this podcast, I noticed it's a little bit chilly. I haven't felt that this chilly. You're going to have to put socks on. <laughs> do we sell those? Jo we sell John, quick. <laughs> we do, we do not yet have socks. I might have to find a different okay. vendor to go ahead okay. and provide the socks for us. But uh, John, John, quick question. Um, people might be listening to this podcast in a place where it's starting to get cold. Um, I'm complaining that it's roughly 74, 73 degrees, uh, Fahrenheit down here. I'm wondering what should go underwater when you're doing your diving and you're an avid diver, um, is it warmer or cooler, uh, below the surface? I'm assuming it's warmer, but you're the expert. Why don't it you is, give us it is insight? warmer. In fact, um, uh, my dive computer recorded temperatures of 84 in, uh, water temperature of 84 in the keys and 82, uh, off of, uh, West Palm beach, uh, this past weekend so actually the war the water is warmer than the air imagine that imagine that see that's why you turn in this podcast you're able to hear interesting insight <laughs> like that 
Well, speaking of interesting insight, let me introduce you to another member of our podcast this week. Is a gentleman who's a journalist for over 20 years, worried about white collar crime, did business stories, he also did restaurant reviews. Right now, he does public relations and marketing. Someone else put John Fackler. If you want to get a hold of John Fackler, you can get him on X, which is formerly Twitter, at JT Fackler, F A K L E R. Mr. Fackler, how's it going this week? And um, I'll go ahead and take it. Uh, your New York Jets uh, football team, and uh, we're recording this in Miami Dolphin territory in the NFL. Your New York Jets pulled off a, a, a mighty big upset. So go ahead and gloat because the chances are you're not going to get many more opportunities. Well, to do so. uh, Peter, it's fabulous to be back on the Unauthorized Podcast and, of course, be able to uh, stick your nose in the fact that the Jets won. Okay, the Dolphins won, but at least we're, we're back in it. We you know, beat one of the best uh, teams in the NFL, and next up is the Dolphins. So watch out. Interesting. Okay. Well, we will hold you to that. And uh, rest assured next week, um, of course we'll bring will. it up again for anybody who's a uh, Miami Dolphins fan. <laughs> who else do we have on the podcast this week? We have a gentleman who has been a journalist for over 20 years. He's a real estate editor over at the South Florida Business Journal. He's also an established author, published author. He's uh, published four books, and he will be appearing at the Miami International Book Fair, which occurs every November down here, pretty much kicks off. Our winter tourism season. No one else but Brian Bandel. If anybody wants to get a hold of Brian, they can get him on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get him at Brian, B R I A N, Bandel, B A N D E L L. Brian, how's it going? And what can you give us the title of your books? And if anybody wants to read them, where can they actually purchase them? Uh, Peter, I am doing great. Uh, I'm excited to be on your show once again. So you can find my four novels on Amazon.com. Just search for Brian Bandell on there. Uh, my latest novel is The Rabbi and the Condemned. It's a story about a rabbi looking to free an innocent man from death row. And in the future, death row is in an asteroid mining station. Interesting. Interesting. Brian, did you happen to see the results that NASA got um, from a, a um, I don't know what you would call it. Basically, they, they, they sent something up that landed on an asteroid that was passing. It captured some material and then it returned back to the Earth. And they were actually looking at uh, what, what 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 was involved with this asteroid. Do you happen to see that uh, story that came out a couple of weeks ago? No, yeah, I no? saw that. I saw that they're analyzing it. I don't think they've re released the results of what they've analyzed yet. I don't think it's gold or anything like that, but it could be something pretty interesting <laughs> what they find up there. Maybe a, a hint of uh, you know what what everything in the solar system is made of. Well, you are uh, book number five, right? <laughs> yeah, could Ryan. be, could be, you know. Who knows what they'll find? I don't think they'll find any uh, holographics or anything like that. You know, any any cave art or anything up there. But who knows? <laughs> exactly. Hey, Brian, quick quick question. Um, Miami International Books Fair. I think it's the 40th year or so that they've been putting on the book fair. Uh, in my mind, it sort of kicks off the winter because it's normally held in early November. Uh, authors come in from all over the world. So do uh, uh, members of the audience or I guess the attendees. Everybody comes in. They sort of converge on Miami. It's a great way to sort of get it started. Do you have any memories or do you have any history of the Miami uh, International Book Fair you might be able to share with the audience? Yeah, I, I presented there four times and it, it's always fun uh, to present there. And sometimes when you're when you're there, you'll bump into other authors. Like I, I've seen Dave Berry there and it's always just a fun, funny to kind of meet other authors there, whether they're just uh, just walking in the hallways and up and down the stairs and to kind of pick their brain and to joke around with them. So you never know who you'll see. And it's always fun and fun. And it, you know, and I have, it's also great to go to find some uh, kind of treasures in terms of books you, you don't expect, you know, from different publishing houses around and even find used books that, you know, you can get for a good discount. And with this, what we're all after. And and let me just mention, um, Mr. Fackler, John Fackler, you had a run-in at the Miami International Book Fair a few years back with a famous author who wrote some books that ultimately were turned into movies. A um, guy called <laughs> Irvin Welsh. He was speaking in a small room. The room was uh, standing room only. Mr. Fackler, why don't you pick it up from there? And by the way, the name of the movie was Train Spotting. There was a number one, and ultimately there was a number two. Mr. Fackler, can you give us some insight into your little situation with Irvin Welsh? And how happy he was. Well, with I could, your I could, have, I, I could be wrong. My memory uh -huh. serves me that you were the instigator. Uh -huh. You and I both went to listen to him, and he was there with one of his bouncers or, or security guys, and you, you pushed me, and I went flying on the chairs, uh -huh. and they thought we were a couple of hooligans. So, which he appreciated, since his books are about, about Scottish hooligans. So, what? 
Once again, Mr. Fackler is embellishing. I did nothing of the We were trying to get in. There, there were two seats in the middle of a section, and it must have been about 15 seats deep to get from one side to the other. Kind of like when you go to the movie theater or the cinema, you're trying to like navigate and work your way in. Mr. Fackler was walking through. He's not necessarily fleet of foot, and he ended up stumbling on somebody's feet while it was all shoulder to shoulder. People are in there to see Irvin Welsh, and Mr. Fackler made a little bit of a um, uh, I, I remember that one. That's actually the happy, reality of the story. Uh, Irvin and his security guys. <laughs> I remember that. Fantastic, fantastic. So um, let's go ahead. We're going to get to our six stories. Before we do, let me just remind you, we're not doing um, uh, breaks for this podcast um, anymore for this season. This is season four. So let me just give you a one sponsor. It's my company called Condo Vultures Realty. Condo Vultures Realty. You can go to condovulturesrealty.com if you want to look them up. Uh, we are buy-side brokerage. We do consulting. We also do expert witness. So if you want to sue somebody, you feel as if you overpaid or some, something like that is going on, you need an expert witness on your side, assuming your numbers add up. Um, who knows? Maybe we can help you. So condovulturesrealty.com. That being said, let's go ahead. We're going to get to our first story. John Gruss, we're going to go to you with story number one. I'm going to read you the headline. or read you the first couple graphs, and I want you to provide some insight. So here we go. The publication is the Commercial Observer, and the headline, John, is... Miami's real estate boom could continue to echo. First couple of graphs, Sean, and then I'll ask you to comment. Here we go. Um, this is interesting. They start with a quote, but we'll go with it anyways. Quote, why did we come down? Christopher Schlenk, founder, co-chairman, and president of Manhattan-based Savannah, pondered Wednesday at uh, the Commercial Observer Software to Development and Capital Leadership Forum, Forum held at the Bath Club in Miami Beach because everyone was moving down. Story goes on to say earlier this year, Savannah lost a luxury condo project in West Palm Beach, marking its first development outside of New York. Even as COVID-19 health crisis fades and interest rates are at their highest levels in 22 years, South Florida is still riding high from its pandemic-fueled bull market. Speakers on various panels and in one-on-one conversations concluded. Demand for both foreign and domestic buyers remains strong, according to some of the region's biggest developers and attendants, including the related groups J.P. Perez, Terra's David Martin, Royal Palm Company's Daniel Hadzi. And then finally... Um, the added demand is aided, uh, elevate neglected neighborhoods. A guy called J. Philip Parker, who's a commercial broker over at Douglas Sullivan. He's got a quote that says, I remember 20 years ago having people come to me and say, there's only one place I want to live, and that's Miami Beach. Today, there were so many more neighborhoods where people want a home, J. Parker said, referring to downtown Miami and other parts of South Florida. John, what do you make of the fact that everybody is rosy and everybody is on the south side? Of, uh, yeah, well, the, in the story. these kinds of conferences and forums are, you know, just basically uh, rah rah events, um, and uh, and this is <laughs> this is sort of a rah rah story, um, and and reflects that. You know, I I um I kind of read these stories like I would uh, Chinese communist propaganda. Um, <laughs> you have to sort of read between the lines. You have to sort of. Um, uh, 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 into it a little bit about what's going on and, um, and deeper into the story, there was a little nugget about, um, the issues that they're having with bank financing. And, um, I, I think that's really critical because now the regional banks are basically on the sidelines. Um, you know, they're, the regulators are all over them right now, uh, for commercial real estate lending and, and, and basically, splurging on commercial real estate loans and um basically the regional banks are on the sidelines and it was it was really interesting to note that um you know deep in the story uh there was mention of uh issues with with financing and you know i think i think that's going to be a major issue in terms of you know keeping the momentum going i think that um you know without without cheap financing a lot of projects are just not going to happen and um, I, th- I think they alluded to that, but you kind of have to read it like you would, you know, pro- the propaganda. You know, you have to sort of get a sense of, you know, what's what's going on and the and the tone of it. So that's kind of what I got out of it. Um, and, and and John, let, let me just provide some insight for maybe anybody who's listening to this or watching this podcast, uh, talking about the lenders and the financing. So there's a guy called Asi Symbol. He's a developer. Um, Kind of made a name down here uh, 15, 20 years ago. He bought a piece of dirt on the south bank of the New River in downtown Fort Lauderdale. The name of his company is Symbol DLT Companies. He also has some property in and around the Wynwood um, Midtown area of Miami. So here, here's what's um, uh, referred to from Hasi. 
says lenders are part of the problem sometimes. This is paraphrased. They require so much coverage to a point where, and this is a quote, it really doesn't make sense. Um, Sean, if you got a developer saying that uh, it's not making sense from a lender's perspective to go ahead and borrow money and go ahead and try to build, is that the telltale sign? Is that a canary? No, I, this, that's exactly you know what what uh, I was referring to is um, you know hints hints okay. that you know the the lending environment has changed um, and it certainly has. I mean, interest rates uh, going up the way they have so dramatically, and now you have a lot of projects that. Um, you know, perhaps would have made sense with cheap financing and not, not so much now with, with the financing, if it's available, because I mean, now, now you may not even get financing, um, and, and lenders require all kinds of covenants and they require all kinds of, um, you know, equity now in deals that perhaps they may, may not have a few years ago. Interesting. Um, uh, Br Brian, I'm just wondering. You do, you write a lot about, uh, and you're the real estate editor over at Software Business Journal. You write a lot about real estate. You write a lot about finance. Um, you know, well, if you talk to them in private, they're not as optimistic because they know that it's very difficult to get the projects to move forward with financing, with the cost of construction, the cost of insurance. There are a lot of obstacles, you know, especially the high rise project. The high rise project costs significantly more to build, and there's a much longer timeline to build them. So there's demand from people, um, but again, it, it's tough to make the numbers work. And you know, at, and the question is, in order to make the numbers work, you have to have high prices. And how many people are going to continue paying those prices? And so far, a lot of the projects are doing well, but again, you'll notice that there's basically two types of projects: the ultra luxury project, and then the short term rental project. Nothing really in between. Yeah, so th that's basically what we're getting. So how many, how much more ultra luxury and short term rental can we do? I don't know. We'll we'll see. Right now they seem to be selling fairly well, but making the numbers work is a real challenge, and they have to keep raising the prices in order to make it work with, you know, all the the huge costs of this development. Right, Brian. Brian let, let me ask you a question. Um, we we've seen references, and we've made references on this podcast in the in the past about the number of rentals that are under construction in and around South Florida there in this particular cycle. Um, 55,000 is a number that was thrown around. Could you, could, I don't want to pitch you flat-footed, but um, anything you can tell us about the rental market, what's under construction, what's already been delivered, and what the sentiment has been like, um, either from a lender perspective and or a developer perspective? Well, well, rents are softer than they were a year ago. Before, they were going up double digits a year. Now... They're going up slightly. Uh, I was just speaking to a leasing broker and who specializes in West Palm Beach last week, and he says that it's actually leasing has slowed down in the new buildings in West Palm Beach. Uh, he thinks maybe he's not sure if it's the season or maybe there was just so much that was delivered at once. Uh, but yeah, the issue is when you have that much delivered at once, um, and everyone needs high rates to justify the cost of construction, right? They can't really afford to discount all that much. So that creates a lot of pressure. And then you're you're facing competition from the condo market because a lot of these condo buyers, they want to list their units for rent too. So the, the question is, how, how much demand really is there? A lot of the new buildings are reporting that they're leasing up and they're doing okay. But again, we're seeing a lot move forward. Now, at some point, the market might kind of regulate itself because the high construction costs might cause people to say, well, now's not time that time to break ground so that might give more time for the the renters to catch up but i mean if you if you look at the numbers if you look at the population data a lot of the studies they still even though there's been a lot of construction there's still a lot of people trying to move here there's a lot of people trying to move out you know to leave leave their home and you know get out from their parents you know at, at these rents though is it possible you know so they so i think they need to take a quick look and say okay how, how many people are afford, can a, a pay like $2,800 a month, you know, for that starter apartment here? You know, that might be a little much. Maybe, maybe we should focus more on the suburbs to get a lower, lower starting point for, for some of this stuff. Great point. And that's a great transition, Brian, for story number two. This is a piece that you wrote, Brian Bandel. Um, uh, this is a piece that appeared in the South Florida Business Journal. I'm going to go ahead. I'll read you the headline, read you the first couple of graphs. Then I want you to provide any kind of insight you can. So here we go. Headline related group, which, by the way, is the largest, uh, I'd say, vertical condo developer in South Florida, possibly even the state of Florida, 
Related Group launches sales of Las Olas condo starting at a million dollars. And here we go for a couple of graphs, Brian. Related Group has launched sales for a condo on Las Olas Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale with a luxury Italian. All right, the, the and their residence by Pinaferino would feature 163 condos and 45 stories at 521 East Las Olas Boulevard. Miami-based Related Group first filed plans for the condo in 2022 after assembling the 0.65 acre site for a combined $11.25 million in 2020. But this is the first time it has revealed the branding and project details. Its branding partner, Pinaferino, has worked with Related Group before, most notably on the 1100 Millicento by Pinaferino in Miami nearly a decade ago. Now, they're bringing the Italian design to Las Olas, a street popular for its restaurants, shops, and Class A office buildings. And here's a quote from Nick Perez, President of Related Group's Condominium Division. Nick says, Las Olas embodies timeless allure and urban evolution with a unique pedestrian lifestyle, complete with many culinary and retail gems. Las Olas is now easily Fort Lauderdale's hottest residential market. After years of thought for growth, growth, the area is now finally ready for high design, service-driven condominium. And we couldn't be more honored to partner with Pinaferina to craft our vision into reality. The condos are ranged from 1,800 square feet to 4,300 4, square feet and include floor-to-ceiling windows plus Sub-Zero and Wolf appliances. Prices start at $1.6 million a door. Wow, that's a big number, Brian. $1.6 million a door to live in uh, Fort Lauderdale on Las Olas, and you're not on the beach. Um, I guess Related yeah. Group has done its due diligence, and they think that market's strong enough? Yeah, it's interesting. You're not on the beach. You're not on the river. But you, you know, you are in the Las Olas. You have the fancy address near the restaurants and the office. Uh, so yeah, that's very. It's it's interesting uh, that they're going for that price point, but also they're doing larger units. They're doing more amenities. So it sounds like they're aiming for the family market here. You know, starting at eighteen hundred square feet. So I, I guess what they're looking for is a lot of the condos in South Florida are smaller. If you're trying to move here. With a family, you know, and kids, and you want to cut, you know, maybe a couple of rooms for each kid. It's not, there's not as many options. So here, I think they're going to give you those options, but obviously it'll cost a bit more. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, uh, Brian, quick question. I don't know if you you know the answer to this. Let's go throw it out there. Um, maintenance fees. Uh, this is the fee you pay per month based on the price per square foot to live in a building. It covers the concierge. It covers the uh, insurance. It covers property taxes for the common errands. All that that stuff it covers the swimming pool. Um. You know, we see it anywhere from seventy-five cents to a buck twenty-five. Generally speaking, if these units are starting at eighteen hundred square feet, that's a hell of a nut to be paying every month uh, to live in a condominium that's not located on the beach. Any talk about maintenance fees? Was anything referenced? Anything uh, sort of discussed? And is that an issue ultimately, or is it because these units are so luxurious because of the location? People are simply willing to absorb it because they have that uh, quality of life and that walkability. Yeah, I, I think obviously the maintenance fees are, are going to be a little higher in a building like this because they're talking about, you know, 35,000 square feet of amenities, fitness center, pickleball court, catering kitchen, sports lounge, two pools, you know, wellness spa and all that. So anytime you have that many amenities, you're going to have a staff or it's going to be a little larger. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they had ballet service in a building like this. You know, so yeah, you're going to pay more for a staff in this type of building. But again, this is if, if you're paying that 1.6 million for the condo, you you kind of expect that's going to yep. go with the territory. I think if if it was kind of a mid market building, if it was a building with 400 or 500 thousand per unit, then I think the the unit owners might be more work cost conscious on the maintenance here. It's just sort of like you know when you get to a certain level, the maintenance and the taxes and all that are just something you're you know you're used to. Uh, kind of, I think, you know, especially if, if for people who are making this yes. like their second home, you know, that may not be, you know, the, their biggest concern here. But yeah, for for men, for for a lot of regular people, it's a lot. But yeah, they're they're aiming for the super net worth, you know, high net. Got it, got it, got it. Um, M M Mr. Fackler, you lived in Broward for over thirty years. Uh, you were in Western Broward. Uh, memory serves me correct. One of the reasons you lived out there is that Broward was cheaper than Miami Dade County. Mr. Facker, what do you make of the fact that, you know, an 1,800-square-foot place on Las Olas, or let's call it ballpark dollar a square foot, I haven't really heard of maintenance under 75 cents a square foot per month. What, what do you make of the fact that, you know, $1,800 in uh, maintenance fees, uh, does that mean Fort Lauderdale has a cheaper alternative to Miami? Is, is this a telltale sign that maybe Fort Lauderdale 
He's just as expensive to live in as Miami. And what, what does that mean for Broward as somebody used to live in Broward for quite some time? Well, um, I think it's going to be a long way off before Broward reaches the price point of luxury um, units that Miami has. Miami continues to be able to absorb higher prices. Um, and I, okay. I think it, it might be a one-off in this case, but, you know, hard to tell. And by the way, I was in Broward for 20 years in Miami for 10, just to let you know. You My welcome. fault. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Right. Um, Mr. Fackler, John Fackler, we're going to see you with story number three. Mr. Fackler, I'm going to read you a headline for a couple of graphs, and I want you to comment. This is coming out of Channel 6, which is the NBC affiliate down here in Miami. Headline, stuck in traffic. Miami's now ranked as one of the most congested cities in the world. First couple of graphs, Miami time is under attack as a fame excuse to use when arriving late to parties. Keeps getting later and later. Uh, after a new report by INRAX places the South Florida city is one of the 10 worst cities to drive in in the world. Yes, the world. The report states that Miami traffic increased 30% from 2021 to 2022, placing it as the number eight most congested city alongside New York City, Palermo, Bogota, and Monterey, Mexico. With a total of 105 hours lost to traffic, that places the 305, which is the area code for Miami, above the city of Los Angeles. If you're wondering, uh, what those lost hours means. It's essentially a time you lose traveling in the hours of traffic versus the hours when there was no traffic, according to Bob Pichu, a traffic analyst with INRAX. Mr. Fackler, what do you make of that? Uh, we're now the eighth worst city for traffic congestion in the world. Is that justified? Is it wrong? Is it a hyperbole? And what about all the new developments that have been planned and are coming down the pike in South Florida? Well, let me first start off with some personal experience um, this past Friday, um, I actually had to take my car via US-1 all the way to Kendall, my Jeep, because it was having problems. I could not believe it was bumper to bumper on a Friday. Um, I realized school's back in session and some other issues are at play, but he, my car was stolen every time I came to a light. And I'm like, what is going on? What happened to remote working? I thought there was less people on the roads. I realize companies are asking employees to come back now, but not in any huge numbers. Most people, a lot of people are still working from home. So I'm like, you know, how is this going to uh, play when they build new, you know, new towers are coming online? Just like you mentioned earlier. I mean, it's, it's terrible. And this is, again, you know, I've seen this downtown. I've seen it on the beach, but this was on US-1. This was going from a uh, little Havana area to uh, Kendall. And I was like, my God, I mean... How, how are we going to be able to bring these towers online and, and how are we going to fix the traffic? Because there's really no way to do it. I mean, there's no new roads going up as far as I know. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, um, it's a problem. Interesting, interesting. Well, you know, and this is my time to go, Mr. Beckler, early on. You get to celebrate the fact that the New York Jets football team surprised the world and actually beat um, um, uh, a team that's very good in the Philadelphia Eagles. This is my time to go. This month, October, represents 10 years since I gave up my car. It was not court-ordered. I simply gave enough because of the cost, <laughs> and I don't want to deal with any of the drama involved with it, but 10 years since I gave up my car. Uh, Jean or Brian, um, are people likely to go my way, where they give up their car and they live close to public transportation? I rely on tri-rail. I rely on metro rail. I walk. I take trolleys. I don't take buses. Um, or are people going to be like Mr. Fackler, where they're stuck in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic at 3 o'clock? Now, granted, He's driving 20 miles an hour, so he's slowing the whole wave uh -huh. down. But what, what, what do you guys think? Is it going my way or is it going Mr. Backler's way as we go forward with all these new developments coming to South Florida? Yeah, you can't, you can't get people out of their cars, uh, especially in South Florida, where, you know, we've had a very hot summer. And, you know, uh, and, and public transportation, quite frankly, is just not up to, not up to par on a, on a major city. Um, it, public transportation here is not where it should be uh, for, for a major city like Miami, but that's, you know, uh, that's, that's because we've been growing so fast. So I, I think people are still going to take their cars and they're just going to have to adapt to it. I mean, I, um, I use my car sparingly um, and I only use it um, off peak. I mean, because the traffic's a nightmare yeah. uh, and it, then, then it's livable, you know, but, but otherwise, no. Brian, are you going to tie this score and make it two no car and two pro car? Or are you on the side of Mr. Fackler? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I have a car. Uh, I get around with, with my Tesla with the, uh, the, the HOV lane app. Uh, sticker helps a little bit. You can use the HOV lane without 
getting any fees for it. So that that helps somewhat, but it's still a long drive. I mean, I'm driving from Broward to down to the Brickell area of Miami, and it's yeah, it's a long slog and it's exhausting. So I wish I didn't have to use the car, but you know, that's just kind of necessary. I've take I took the Bright Line before, and that helps if you need to take a longer haul from like Miami to West Palm. But yeah, it, it, it it's challenging to be without a car. I'm not sure how you do it, Peter, but. <laughs> But, you know, it could certainly save you a lot of money. I, I really wonder, given the cost of insurance, you know, how people do it. You know, like as my kids start driving, you know, I have two teenage drivers now. And it's like every time you had a teenager, you know, it costs a lot of money, you know. And it used to be like relatively cheap to get, you know, get a, you know, get a car for a teenager and get insurance. But now it's a lot of money. So... So, Brian, I will give you a thought. The next time you're in your car driving your Tesla and the HOV light, and there's somebody in front of you going below the speed limit with a turn signal on endlessly, chances are it's Mr. Right. Fast. Yeah, the story down before. Let's go to John and Bruce. Uh, John, I'm going to read you the headline. I'll read you the first couple of graphs. I'm going to want you to comment. This piece is coming out of the Commercial Observer. Here we go with the headline. Developers plan $1 billion campus in Miami Health District. Subhead. Highland Park, Miami will include medical office space, 1,000 residential units, and a hotel. Anybody that knows where the Highland Park area of Miami is? It's effectively just south of Jackson Hospital and where the University of Miami Hospital is. And it's on the south side of the Dolphin Expressway. And here we go. First couple of graphs. Sean, Black Salmon and Ellen Morris Company have teamed up to build a major mixed-use project that's poised to greatly expand Miami's medical infrastructure. The planned $1 billion complex, dubbed Highland Park, Miami, will include 500,000 square feet of medical-related office space, 1,000 residential units, a 150-room hotel, and green spaces. Development will span seven acres at 800 Northwest 14th Street between the Miami River and State Road 836, which is the Dolphin. Preliminary site clearing is expected to begin later this year. John, um, Jackson Hospital, the University of Miami Hospital, it's it's kind of this um, this little oasis um maybe would be the word uh it's a rough areas around there there's starting to be some um some uh build up that's going on um it sounds like this development is targeting uh doctors who work at jackson who work at the university of miami um i'm just wondering a can you give us an overview how much is this needed and second of all how likely are doctors who uh were working at the hospitals and all the uh support services around there how likely are they lived um, are they to live that close to work when there's no beach, there's no sand, there's no water other than a little uh, spit of the Miami River. What say you, Jean? Yeah, I mean, I, look, um, uh, on, the, on the positive side, um, Florida is a medical destination. I mean, we do have quite a bit of medical tourism. Uh, people from uh, Latin America and other parts of, of the U.S. Uh, co come to Miami. They come to Florida uh, for, you know, special procedures. Um, and Miami is, is a part of that. Uh, so is Orlando actually. Um, and, um, some, some other parts of Florida. So, I mean, Florida is known as a medical tourism destination. So I, I think there is demand for it. Um, now the, you know, the thing about announcements like this is y yes, it's, uh, you know, we, we live in the land of announcements. <laughs> so, so, uh, this is just an announcement. I mean, preliminary site clearing, uh, later <laughs> next year, they said, I mean, you know, there's just not a whole lot of details about the financing and the demand. And it's, it's kind of hard to tell, like, um, you know, uh, what kind of, what kind of demand they're expecting. I mean, uh, I haven't seen, I haven't seen any data to back up the <laughs> fact that, you know, there's this incredible, demand for uh, office space and apartments for doctors. Um, so, you know, and doctors, you know, doctors, uh, you know, they probably want to live in, um, you know, nicer areas of town, um, this is sort of a, a rough area of town a little bit. And then you know, perhaps uh, doctors might want to live on the beach or, or in Coral Gable. It's hard to say. And I mean, you know, you can hire a fancy, uh, uh, a fancy architecture firm like Architectonica to like design you this like fancy futuristic looking building and everything. But until we really know the details of the financing, the demand and, and, and what's happening with pre-leasing, uh, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just another, it's another announcement. And, um, you know, a lot of these institutions, 
Uh, I have to say, um, having, having worked with various uh, medical institutions, you know, they're very competitive among themselves. I mean, you know, they all talk about cooperating uh, together, blah, blah, blah. But when it comes down to it, this is a serious business, very competitive. And even a lot of medical institutions in Miami, uh, in an area, are competitive amongst each other. And um, they're not likely to sort of play nicely. So it'll be interesting to see like how everybody gets along and, and whether they're willing to like, uh, you know, participate in, in this effort. Um, but I think, you know, as far as, uh, as far as, a, an overall concept in terms of medical tourism and, a and Miami is a medical destination. I mean, certainly it makes a lot of sense. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, story number five, uh, Brian Badell, we're going to go to you. This is a piece you wrote up here in the South Florida visitor journal. I read you the headline. I read you the first couple of graphs, and I want you to comment. Here we go with the headline. Headline: Insurance costs way down development. Uh, subhead: Builders say surge could lead to a slowdown. First couple of graphs, Brian: A dramatic increase in property insurance rates this year has helped spur a slowdown in real estate sales and development in South Florida, and it's a situation that's not expected to improve anytime soon. Uh, according to industry experts, commercial property insurance uh, rates have spiked. Uh, from 25 to 100 percent over the past year, depending on the property type and location, deductibles also are higher in most cases. Combined with rising interest rates, that has greatly increased the carrying cost of buying uh, commercial real estate for developers. A triple whammy of expensive builder risk insurance, high interest rates, and elevated construction prices can make some projects simply too costly to pursue. Um, Matthew Rieger, president and CEO of uh, the Miami Base Housing Trust Group, one of the state's largest affordable housing developers, said the cost to insure an apartment in his portfolio has jumped from 351 bucks a unit in 2018 to 1654 as a uh, right now. And here's a quote from him. He says, one thing I can assure you is rents have not increased in a similar way, he said. I'm leasing units for seven or eight months a year only to cover the insurance. Forget about the property taxes and payroll. It's completely out of balance. And that alone makes it difficult, if not impossible, to underwrite new transactions. Brian, we have a situation where everybody's bitching and moaning about affordability of housing. And the groups that are trying to build housing that the the regular person gets sort of achieve, they almost can't do it because the insurance prices are so much out of whack. What um what what else can you tell us about the situation? And will it be improving anytime soon? Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to be improving anytime soon. Uh, yet Florida legislature did pass insurance reforms. Most of those reforms had to do with residential insurance, and even in the residential market, that's not going to bring rates down. If anything, they hope it just won't increase as much as it increased in the past. But for commercial insurance, it's a huge problem because they also have to insure these buildings. And unlike in the residential market where you can lean on citizens' property insurance and when you have a, a state backstop like the, the catastrophe fund, you don't have that in the private market. In the private market, it's all for-profit. It's reinsurance companies. They're all looking to make money. Uh, and the rates are very high. So it's tough for market rate apartments, but they can at least pass it on to the renters. But if you're affordable, you can't really pass it on to the renters because your rent is limited to what's affordable for someone making like 80% or area median income. So their rent is capped, but their insurance costs can go up unlimited. So the, when they're looking at this, it's killing them. You know, a lot of them, they projected a much lower cost of insurance. They're finishing the project. They're leasing it up. But when they get the numbers back on the insurance, they're like, wow, this is this is like almost no return on this investment. This is not. This is not good. And believe me, it's hurting market rate developers too. It's just that market rate, they can try and pass it on to the tenant. And in affordable, they, re they really can. Interesting, interesting. And, and I should mention, I was just scrolling through near the bottom of the story. Brian, you make reference to 10 North Group, which is a, uh, an entity that builds uh, workforce or affordable type of housing. For disclosure, I, I sit on a board, uh, member of the board of directors for one of their subsidiaries. So I just want to put that out there. I don't want anybody thinking one way or another. Um, uh, Brian, another thing that's come up there, uh, in, in just in reading the story and there's, and there's so many interesting points, um, talking about the impact to developers. Now, the actual people who are building this stuff, it says, despite st uh, strong fundamentals with solid occupancy rates and rent, few South Florida commercial properties are trading now because of high insurance costs, interest rates, and construction costs, said Mark Rubin, executive vice president of Boca Raton offices of Calliers International, when he focuses on South Florida office, retail, and industrial spaces, these factors have reduced the prices buyers are willing to pay. But most sellers don't want to sell for those prices unless they absolutely have to. 
Ryan, how do you break that impasse where anybody coming in is like, this is going to cost me so much due to material costs and everything else. And then you have sellers saying, I know what the real market is and I'm not going to let it go for anything less than that. What typically breaks an impasse like that, whether it's workforce slash affordable housing or it is residential or it's car sales or anything? What have you found over the course of your 20 plus year career? What, what, what has to change for us to see movement one way or another? A lot of times they might still buy it if they feel there's enough upside, if they can look at a property, say for an existing property, if they could say, well, if I put some money in and I renovate it, I can generate more income from it. Uh, or if they say, well, I've seen a couple yeah. of properties trade, like the former Star Starwood office in Miami Beach was mostly vacant. So they're like, well, the upside is I lease it out and it'll be nicer and it'll make more income. So a lot of times it'll be a situation like that. But for a property that's fully stabilized sometimes and they don't see a lot of upside, the challenge is I'm going to buy it. How much more can rents go up? But what will the new insurance costs be? A lot of times it used to be insurance was an afterthought when you were buying something. But now insurance can be a deal killer. Because if you if you get that insurance quote in, and it's it's much higher, you're like, wait a second, this person, you can't assume you're going to pay what he's paying. A lot of times, you get your new insurance quote, it'll be thirty percent higher. So you're like, wait a second, if, yeah, if the yeah. insurance is thirty percent higher, my my return on this investment is not eight percent. My return on this investment is five percent, and for five percent, I might as well go to the bank down the street and get that six month CD account. You know what? Why am I bothering? So, so that's the problem here. If, there, if the insurance is knocking out the returns so much, the returns are not attractive enough to do the deal. Interesting. Uh, Jean, uh, let, let me ask you a quick question. Um, you, you've been talking about the insurance issue for quite some time. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just wondering um, if you can make it real simple for the audience. If 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 developers stop building because insurance costs are high and sellers don't want to... Um, Letting let a property go for any reasonable price from a developer's perspective, um, and and sales freeze, and you've made a lot of reference to the fact that the market is frozen hey. right now. What ultimately happens to insurance if things aren't trading, John? Could we see a pullback in insurance, or could we actually see insurance prices even go up because there's even less uh, deal flow, if you will? So, what, what what would be your take on that, John? Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, you know uh, the simple the simple fact of the matter is is that um, prices are going to have to come down. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the market, uh, you know, doesn't like a vacuum. So, uh, uh, and what's going to break it is, um, is prices, uh, on deals. Sellers are going to have to come down. And the only way, in my opinion, that, uh, we're going to see that is through distress. Um, uh, I think, uh, distress sales, foreclosures, um, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, apartment uh, landlords are just not going to be able to make the numbers work. And we're going to see some forced sales and some distressed sales. And I, I think that's the only way the log jam is going to break. In my opinion, uh, that's what's happened in the past. I mean, that's how Florida real estate, that's what happens when, when Florida, Florida's busts happen, you know, um, that <laughs> it clears out the market. It allows new players to come in. And, you know, insurance is just one of those fixed costs like you and and it's just going to be have to be part. It's just part of the it's part of the mix now. Uh, you, can, you can't avoid it. So, I mean, something else has to give and that's pricing. And I think you're going to get that through distress sales. OK, and just uh, one, one follow up question, just to put it to the uh, to, to the round table. Um, is it typically a black swan that causes it or is it simply time? The amount of time that somebody is financing and then lo and behold, the interest rate adjusts. Uh, the term comes due and all of a sudden there's a, a wow moment where, you know, you were financed at 3% and now suddenly you're financing 8 or 9 or 10%. What, 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 what do you guys anticipate? Are we going to see a black swan like a Lehman Brothers or a pandemic or are we likely to just see that the loans come due and all of a sudden everybody gets that shock effect of the brand new uh, uh, insurance rates? Yeah, I think, I think as the loans rates. come due, it's going to cause a problem. Uh, because you know, when they when they realize the loans coming due, then they'll be forced to sell. A lot of people who, if their loans not coming due, they're like, "Well, why would I sell at a loss? It doesn't make any sense. I'll just I'll just yeah. wait." Uh, but if your loans coming due, you may not have a choice. So then it just becomes the fundamentals of the market. Now, South Florida is in a better mm -hmm. situation than say New York, San Francisco, and Chicago, 
because we have more demand for a lot of the real estate, the office market, the residential market is healthier than those markets. But there will still be prob properties with a problem. You know, properties that just the numbers won't work, the loans are coming due, and they might have to you know, sell them for a price that's disappointing. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Um, and yeah. if, we, if, we have, if we have a banking crisis, which you know, some people are suggesting that the regional banks are in big trouble um, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but commercial real estate being one of them, um, you know, certainly if, if, um, if some of the banks start failing, um, then, uh, that, that commercial real estate is, could, could be at risk. So, um, you know, the government's going to take in to, to, to take them on and, and there's going to be some, some forced selling that way. Interesting. Well, that's definitely something for us to watch. Uh, great story, Brian. Thank you guys for the analysis. Um, story number six, uh, Mr. Beckley, we're going to go to you. We're going to give you a two for um, you are somebody who sort of emerges our expert in condo association uh, uh, shenanigans, let's put it. So I got two stories. I'm going to leave with one story, then I'm going to follow suit with a second story, Mr. Bathler. And this piece is coming out of local tennis, the ABC affiliate down here in Miami, WPLG. Here's the headline, and I'll read the first couple of graphs, and I want you to comment, Mr. Bathler. Headline, ex-Miami Beach condo board president tried to set residence truck on fire, police said. Subhead police said he also sent death threats to board members. And here we go, Mr. Fackler. The former president of the South Beach Condominium Association. By the way, anybody wondering, this is a condo located in the South and Fifth neighborhood, which is the most expensive part of Miami Beach in general from a condominium perspective. It's South of Fifth Street, uh, right near where Joe's uh, Stone Crab is and um, the Apogee at the really high-end condominium. This one isn't particularly high-end, but it's located in a fantastic area. So let, let me go ahead with the um, first couple of graphs again, Mr. Backler. The former president of the South Beach Condominium Association um, exacted an apparent reign of terror this spring, um, making several residents fear for their safety, according to police. Miami Beach police arrested Mark Joseph uh, um, Magsiano on Sunday after accusing him of sending several threatening text messages to a board member of 366 Washington Avenue Condominium and trying to set a residence truck on fire back in April. As the story goes on to say, according to police, on April 18th, um, um, Maggie Sano sent a number of violent and derogatory text messages to a board member, including using a homophobic slur. He says, I'm going to sick, sure you're dead within 48 hours. I'm going to cut open TMTRW, and I will murder you shortly. And it was all part of a disturbing pattern from the 34-year-old Canadian National Police said. That pattern, police said, continued on April 29th when um, Maxiano lit a cloth on fire and threw it into the gas tank of the residence truck at about 2.30 in the morning. Um, Mr. Factor, we've been talking a lot about uh, members of the condo board associations getting arrested for a bunch of financial shenanigans. This is the first time I can recall uh, somebody on a condo board or an association actually trying to blow up the entire someone's truck and physical harm. Um, what, what say you, Mr. Beckler? Is this a trend well, well, the, or is this an anomaly? Well, the, well, that's true. We've reported now three weeks in a row of violence directed to, uh, towards residents of condos by associations. It's, it's, it's uncanny that we're seeing this level of violence now increasing over the last several weeks. And, um, you know, it's just, it, it, it begs the question, how smart are these people, these associations? <laughs> I say this because there's surveillance everywhere. There's surveillance in the common areas, in the driveways. In this case, there was surveillance in a, um, the toll road. That's how they caught this guy's uh, uh, license plate. I mean, do these people realize they're not constantly under surveillance? Um, so, you know, the, this happened, uh, several stories that we talked about previously, where they also were under surveillance, and they got very good evidence because of that. So, uh, yeah, I just, um, you know, the, the level of violence seems to be increasing. Um, also the, uh, the fact that these stories are being reported more now, because we've, you know, we did, I'm sure this has been going on for years. It's not, I mean, this is Miami, you know, all hell breaks loose here, but I mean, to, to see them really tracking this now in the press is, uh, good. I mean, obviously, you know, because, uh, you got to bring attention to the violence. Mr. Fecko, let, let, let me give you the other side of that combo story. I told you there are going to be story, two stories. I gave you the first one and the second yeah. one. And let me, set the, let me set the scene before I get into it. Um, the Champlain Tower South collapsed. It was a, uh, a condominium yes. building in Surfside, uh, the Barrier Island, Miami-Dade County, located in Miami, between Miami Beach 
Bell Harbor and Sunny Isles Beach. As a result of that legislation change in the state of Florida, many associations now, which previously had um, basically gave a, a miss or a pass to putting money in reserves and doing some of the necessary work because it didn't really matter. Now, once that tower collapsed and Surfside people realized how uh, significant it is, how dangerous it could be, and the state is now mandating it. So that's the backdrop, Mr. Becker. Let me go ahead and read you the first couple of graphs of this story coming out of the real deal. The headline of the first couple of graphs, and I want you to I want you to tie it in with the gentleman who was trying to blow up a truck. Here we go. Yes. Headline again: the real deal inside alleged fraud at Miami Dade Star Lakes condominium. First couple of graphs: retiree Joseph Rodriguez was on the verge of losing his home to foreclosure in January after missing maintenance fees and six three hundred seven dollar monthly payments for a special assessment at the Star Lakes condo complex in North Miami Dade County. He pleaded for a payment plan. At first, he said association leaders seemed amenable to the idea, but then a lien popped up at Rodriguez's mailbox, forcing him into foreclosure. The 75-year-old felt that the board was trying to seize his unit. And here's a quote from him. He says, um, they knew I had no mortgage, he said, adding that a lender would have first priority in a foreclosure. When you're on your own, it's easy for them to target you and take your property. Mr. Fackler, um, is it possible that associations are basically taking advantage of the fact that the market is so tight with supply that they might be trying to uh, effectively jam up somebody who maybe is yep. uh, uh, on a fixed income? They only right. have so much money going in, and yet inflation is out of control. And now these associations have to deal with everything that's being mandated by the state. I need to sort of square that, Mr. Fackler. Well, that's the thing. I mean, this is this goes to motives, right? Essentially, they're all the association. Uh, the associates of crying wolf. Uh, I'm taking this right from the story too. That they're, they're basically dealing with years of deferred uh, repairs and skyrocketing insurance uh, premiums, following the deadly collapse of the Surfside condos that we talked about earlier. Uh, the states now requiring associations to fully fund their financial reserves, and they've also, as you mentioned, tightened regulations for repairs. Now, on the other side of this, the owners, like you say, it's a 55 and over community. You know, they're on fixed incomes and they're, they're claiming or they're alleging that there's a, there's a bulk buying of foreclosed units may be in the offing. So in other words, they're being pushed into foreclosure because they can't afford the special assessments. So, you know, it's um, uh, it seems like there's no recourse that these people have really because, I mean, how much are these 55 and over units really worth? So, you know, I mean, they're um, they're really jammed up and uh I, I'm I'm actually stunned that there's not more protections for the 55 and old overcrowd. I mean, granted they've you know they tightened the restrictions. I mean, the reserves and the uh, the repairs that are being done. But you know, uh, where, where's the protection for these seniors? I don't know. Brian, John, um, how do you guys see this playing out? Obviously, I don't know what the situation was that triggered this gentleman allegedly to try to set uh, one of the members of this condo association uh, his truck on fire. But I can just imagine people get wound up. The financials, the screws are turning. They're all dealing with inflation. If you're on a fixed income and suddenly you get hit with a special assessment because of all this type of stuff, how, how do you guys sort of square this? Where do you guys see this going forward? And like Mr. Fackler referred to, we're writing, we're, we're discussing story after story, week after week after week about all kinds of stuff going on in, in condo associations. Any, anybody have any comments? Well, there's been so much financial mismanagement at HOAs for many, many years, and now they have to uh, clean up their house. So, um, you know, these are, I mean, I, 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 I've said sort of jokingly that their, their uh, HOAs are, are basically criminal enterprises, uh, but, you know, <laughs> uh, in, in my estimation, I mean, they, they haven't done the job. And so many of these associations have been sort of shrouded in secrecy uh, um, they don't share any of their financials. We have no idea what their financial condition is. And now all of a sudden they're required by law to rebuild their reserves. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, um, it's a ba really bad situation. And of course, you know, if you're a buyer and you're 55 and over and you're on a fixed income, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's impossible. You can't, you can't possibly, I mean, the, the good thing for these people is that they're in a hot market and they can sell, you know? Um, so, I mean, that's, yeah. that's but, but that's who's going to, who's going to buy a condo with that many assessments? You know, it's like, here, buy, buy the condo. We have, we have, a, we have, you <laughs> yeah. know, a $20,000 assessment for every unit, you know, that's, that, that's tough. So I, at some point, Florida needs more rights for condo owners against their association. I think too often it's easy to take advantage of the condo owners 
Uh, I think the legislature really needs to look at protecting the condo owners if you're trying to encourage the association to work with owners instead of just, you know, foreclose on the units and with the greens and everything like that. Because, yeah, there are going to be associations that say, oh, okay, well, you, you can't afford the $20,000. I'll just take their unit and resell it and get it that way. You know, I, we, you know, some of the owners, exactly. you know, it's not the fairest thing to do if, if there's a way to work for them. But if, if the ones that mandate that you work with them, they make this, they screw it. Why, why work with you if I don't have Interesting, interesting, interesting. Well, guys, believe it or not, that was the end of our six stories. So I want to go ahead and thank all members of the round for participating in this podcast. I want to thank Sean Gruce. Sean was a journalist for over 25 years. Right now, he's a publication marketing firm called Gruce Communication. You can check out his uh, company on his website, GrucePR.com, G-R-U-S-S-P-R.com. You can also get him on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get him at John Gruce, J-E-A-N-G-R-U-S-S. Also want to thank Mr. Fackler, John Fackler, he was a journalist for over 20 years, wrote about white collar crime. The business stories also did restaurant reviews. Make sure you do a clip search for some of his restaurant reviews. He said last <laughs> time that they were 30 years ago, but I'm sure they're just as delight, they're, uh, delightful to read today as they were 30 years ago. Anybody who wants to get a hold of Mr. Fackler, get him on X, which is formerly Twitter. Get him at JT Fackler, J T F A K L E R. And I also want to thank Brian Bandell. He's the real estate editor over at the South Florida Business Journal, he's been a journalist for over 20 years. He's published four uh, books, and he's going to be at the Miami International Book Fair this November. If you want to get a hold of Brian, you can get him on X, which is formerly Twitter, at Brian Bandell, B-R-I-A-N-B-A-N-D-E-L-L. And I'm Peter Zaliski of Founder Vulture. If you have any comments, you have any questions for us, go ahead and send a message on X, which is formerly Twitter, at Miami RRP, which stands for Miami Reporters Roundtable Podcast. And don't forget... If you want to check out any of our merchandise, go to condovultures.com, look for the merch. You can get anything from shower curtains to, which, by the way, have Mr. Fackler's face on it, to uh, <laughs> coffee mugs, to T-shirts, to flip-flops or sliders, whatever you want to call them. And um, uh, final tidbit, um, we would love if you could subscribe. We would love it if you would uh, like us. Um, all that being said, hope you enjoyed the podcast. Hope all you gabflies, you picked up some tidbits. You can go out there and share and release to the world, the cocktail party world. And until next time, take care of yourself. Ciao, ciao. It's a simple formula, and it works. Buy low, sell high. We're Condo Vultures, and when it comes to your real estate, we help you buy low. At Condo Vultures, we represent the buyer, and now's the time to buy. Log on to CondoVultures.com for more information. CondoVultures.com. And remember, before you sell high, you have to buy low. Featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, 60 Minutes, and Time Magazine. Condo Vultures Realty, a licensed Florida real estate brokerage capitalizing on the condo correction since 2006. This is Peter Zaliski of the Condo Vultures Podcast. Before I started doing these podcasts, I've been in the business of being a licensed real estate broker, a contributing columnist for the Miami Herald, as well as the Miami Real Deal, but also extra witness work in consulting. So if you are looking for an expert witness or if you're looking for consulting services, a straight talk perspective as to what's going on in a particular marketplace, a building, or the, what happened previously for whatever your situation is, whether you are an attorney whether you are a institutional fund looking to invest or whether you're a lender who's trying to come up with some sort of a strategy and approach for your lending committee going forward, I don't just want to be able to help you to get a hold of me. Please reach out to Peter at condovultures.com. That's Peter at condovultures.com. Or give me a call to the office at 305 865 5859. 305 865 5859.